Hello, aspiring journalists, and welcome to this Entheos Academy class on how to start a regular journaling practice. My name is Hannah Brame. I am a coach and a writer from the UK, and I also run a website called Becoming Who You Are, which you can find at becomingwhoyouare.net. I am also absolutely passionate about journaling. I love, love, love journaling. I've probably been doing it on and off at this point for about 15 years, maybe slightly more even, but I've been doing it regularly for the past seven or eight years, and really there has been nothing else that I can think of, you know, maybe with the exception of therapy and coaching, that has had such a profound impact on my personal development, on my growth, and most importantly, on my happiness. So I'm really, really excited to talk to you today about my 10 big ideas around how to start a regular journaling practice. My hope for you is that you'll walk away from this class with a much clearer idea of exactly what you need to do to start a practice and also, most importantly, what you need to do to maintain it as well. So what you need to do to get beyond that initial first journaling session, whatever that looks like for you, and to carry on and make it a regular part of your life. So before we get into these 10 big ideas, I just want to take a few minutes to explore what journaling is and why does it matter? You know, why should we care about having a regular journaling practice? Why should this be important to us? Lots and lots of reasons. There are so, so many benefits that come from journaling. But the way I like to think about it is that journaling is crucial for two reasons, what I call the two E's. So it gives us a really safe, safe space to express ourselves, that's the first E, and it also gives us a really safe space to explore what's on our minds, our thoughts, our feelings, our hopes, our dreams, our fears. So that's kind of why journaling is so crucial in a nutshell, it's the two E's, expression and exploration. What journaling looks like, it can be whatever you want it to be. And in some ways, that can actually be a bit of a challenge when you're starting out. Whenever we're doing something new, it can actually be quite helpful to have some constraints around journaling um, or around whatever it is that we're doing. And with journaling, there isn't really that in place. So while that can be a bit of a challenge, it's actually a real gift as well, because obviously as individuals, we're all really different. We all have completely different strengths and completely different preferences. I personally love writing. I'm a wordsmith. I'm not much of an artist, but I know that there's going to be some people watching this. Maybe this applies to you. You might think, oh, you know, I'm not such so hot with the writing. I don't really feel like I can express myself so, so well through writing, but I love painting or I love of draw, uh, drawing, sorry. I love speaking. You know, you can also do audio journaling, and that's something I'm going to get into a little bit later. So it really can be whatever you want it to be. Uh, one way of thinking about journaling is it's like yoga for the brain. So it's a way of stretching your mind out. It's a way of releasing tension. It's a way of letting go of things, you know, perhaps things that might not be serving you anymore. And it's also a way of reconnecting with yourself. Like yoga, it's not always comfortable, and that's okay. And usually what you'll find is that the real gold in your journaling is actually slightly on the other side of your edge of discomfort. So there's no right or wrong way to journal. It can be whatever you want it to be. If you're writing, it doesn't have to be grammatically correct. It doesn't even have to make sense. The most important thing is that you get those two E's in, the safe space for expression and the safe space for exploration. So let's get started with big idea number one. The best way to get started is to start. So with anything, when we start out for the first time, it's really tempting to do all this research and make sure we have all the information we need, we have all the right tools, the right equipment, and we want to wait until everything is perfect, until we actually start doing that thing. And I think, you know, we live in a society where we are expected to have all the answers. You know, there's a lot of focus on self-esteem and being above average and that being a good thing. And consequently, that means that when we are adults and we're a beginner at something, being a beginner can be really, really hard. It's usually something that we associate with childhood. It can feel like a really vulnerable place to be, being a beginner and not having all the answers, not necessarily knowing what it's gonna be like or having all the skills. 
So the really tempting thing to kind of bypass that feeling of discomfort is to start reading up on stuff, is to start amassing tools and equipment and resources. But the risk is that we can stay in that place and never actually get started on doing whatever it is we want to be doing. So I am here today to tell you that you have all the tools and resources you need, and you certainly will after watching this class. One of the biggest barriers that people come across, and I think one of the biggest things that can contribute to this idea that, oh, I just need to do a bit more research and then I can start journaling, is that sometimes people can sit down to write and all that chatter that was going on in their minds suddenly goes absolutely silent. There's just nothing there. And your mind can go as blank as the page or the screen in front of you. So if that's happened to you or if that happens to you in the future, uh, it's perfectly normal. It happens to everybody, whether you're a newbie, whether you've been journaling for years and years and years. It's just part of the process and it's part of the way journaling works sometimes. There's two really good reasons this happens. The first reason is that a lot of us are just not used to journaling. We're not used to uh, hearing our thoughts in that way. We're not used to paying attention to ourselves in that way. A lot of our world is very externally focused and that's where we're used to having our attention is the outside world and what's going on around us. Even if you've done things like yoga or meditation, journaling is still a very, very different ball game. Um, obviously, it depends on what kind of meditation you've done, but what I've heard from teachers in the past is to notice your thoughts, but to not get caught up in their stories, so to not kind of get sucked down the rabbit hole of where one story leads to another leads to another. You know, when you notice your thoughts, you return to your breath, or you return to what you can hear or what you can see. With journaling, you want to follow those thoughts. So that can actually be quite an alien feeling to do that consciously because you want to see sometimes where they take you. You know, what is the purpose behind this? Why is this thought coming up right now? So with journaling, you want to see where those thoughts are going to take you. And for a lot of us, this can be really, really weird. You know, we're used to doing it with daydreaming, but daydreaming is quite an unconscious thing, whereas journaling is like purposeful, unconscious daydreaming. So the other reason why you can have a blank mind is sometimes because there's something really, really important underneath that needs to come out. But it can be a little bit scary. Maybe it conflicts with some beliefs that you have about yourself or about the world, but it's still underneath there. It's still waiting to come out. So there's always a really, really good reason for having a blank mind, whether it's just that this is a new way of relating to yourself or because there's something really important underneath, um, something a little bit new, something maybe to do with change, uh, maybe that you have a little fear around that is waiting to be expressed. So when you have a blank mind, the best way to counteract it is to write about the fact you have a blank mind. Um, something I love doing is stream of consciousness journaling, which is when you write about whatever comes into your head. So what this might look like in stream of consciousness is if I'm thinking, gosh, you know, I really don't know what to write right now, I will write. I really don't know what to write right now. And then maybe I'll talk about my feelings about that. Maybe I have a little bit of frustration coming up. Maybe there's part of me that's a little bit cynical about this whole journaling thing to begin with, right? But just talk about your feelings. Talk about the fact that you don't know what to write about. Maybe explore some of your expectations and hopes around journaling, what you're hoping to get out of it. And just see what that takes you. Often having that springboard and starting that process of writing, even if we're writing about the fact that we don't know what to write about, <laughs> that's enough to get us going. So that is big idea number one. The best way to get started is to start. Big idea number two, choose your format. Journaling is traditionally thought about as a pen and paper activity. Um, however, it absolutely doesn't have to be that way. Over the last few years in particular, there has been a complete explosion in the number of digital journaling tools that are also available in the form of software, web programs, apps, uh, you name it, it probably exists now. So it's a really, really exciting time to be starting to journal and to be diving into this world for the first time. As you're thinking about which format's going to suit you better, whether it's going to be what I call analog journaling, and by that I mean kind of traditional pen and paper, where you actually have like a tangible notebook you can hold, um, or more digital journaling where things are stored on your hard drive or online, 
think about your lifestyle and think about what is best going to currently suit your lifestyle. So if you're like me and you travel a lot, maybe digital journaling would be better for you so you're not kind of lugging notebooks around everywhere. Um, equally, something to think about is what kind of journaling you want to do. So I actually like to mix it up because I love, I love notebooks. I'm a bit of a stationary fiend, so I always love to have a notebook to hand, even though I do travel a lot, even though it's kind of a pain, <laughs> I still do it. But what I have found is notebooks suit me for certain types of journaling, whereas digital journaling is perfect for other kinds. So this has come up for me particularly around stream of consciousness journaling. I've tried both types of um, journaling, analog and digital with this. And what I found is that when I'm writing by hand, I can't actually write fast enough to keep up with my thoughts. Whereas when I'm typing, I type a lot faster than I write and it's the perfect speed for me. So although I use a notebook for some kinds of journaling, when I'm doing stream of consciousness journaling, I keep it all on my computer just because it's so much easier to kind of stay in the flow to stay on board with what I'm doing. So those are two things to consider, is your lifestyle and also what kind of journaling you're doing and what format is going to lend themselves best to that. Big idea number three, choose your tools. So this is kind of related to big idea number two, but we're digging a little bit deeper now and looking at exactly what you're going to use to journal. For some of you, this is going to be kind of a non-issue, right? You're going to be happy using whatever. But for other people, if you're a little bit like me, perhaps, you're going to be super fussy about what kind of notebook you use, what kind of pen you use, what kind of paper is in the notebook, the width of the lines, like all of that stuff is <laughs> really important to me. And this is super, super important because, as I said, the best way to get started is to start. The best way to stay started is to make sure you're using tools you love and you're having an enjoyable experience. So think about what tools are really going to make this an enjoyable experience for you. Is there a particular kind of notebook that you like? Is there a particular software you've seen where you love the aesthetic and it just really helps your thoughts flow really smoothly? So I encourage you to experiment. And at the same time, I also encourage you to be mindful of zigzagging. So by zigzagging, what I mean is jumping from one thing to another to another and falling into that trap I talked about in the first big idea, which is that you spend so long experimenting with all these different tools and all these different programs and notebooks and everything that you never actually start your regular journaling practice. So there's a balance there between finding the tools that are right for you, finding the tools that mean you are going to love this experience, and also maybe not using this as a reason to not start. So that's big idea number three, choose your tools. Big idea number four is consistency over quantity. So when I was planning this class, I asked my tribe on Facebook, what are the biggest barriers or challenges to you starting a regular journaling practice? And there were two things that came up as the winners, like definitely by far the things that most people talked about. The first one was privacy, which is something that I'm going to talk about a little bit later in this class. But the second one was this question of not having enough time to have a consistent journaling practice. So I'm going to be quite blunt and I'm just going to bust this not enough time myth right now because if you think about your life and you think about what you do spend your time on, you know, even if you feel like you are rushed from the minute you wake up to the minute you go to sleep, there's one of two things happening. The first thing is that you're telling yourself you don't have enough time, but the real issue is that you're not making time for the things that are really important to you. So we all have these times during our day where maybe we're not spending our time as consciously as we'd like. You know, maybe we end up vegging out in front of the TV or, you know, getting distracted by Facebook or going down the Wikipedia rabbit hole. You know, that's my personal favorite. <laughs> and we all have those times. And if you think back to how much time you spend on that in any given day, maybe that's time you could be using for things like journaling instead. So that's the first step is to really question, am I using my time in a way that is most aligned with my personal growth and that is most aligned with my values? 
if you look at your time and you really can't identify any areas where you're wasting time and you just look at your day and it's like jam-packed from beginning to end, again, I would really ask you to question your priorities. And these are kind of tough questions, but to ask yourself things like, well, how important is it to me to have a good relationship with myself? How important is it to me to have a connection with myself, to have greater self-knowledge? to be able to gain more clarity, more confidence, more courage, to have a safe place where I can express and explore what's on my mind. And if you think about those questions in the context of, is it worth five minutes of my day? You will be able to find that five minutes, I promise you. And that's really what this is about, is just finding five minutes. I think some people have the idea that when you journal, you need to sit down for like an hour or two hours at a time. And most people think of that and they think, I have no idea when that is going to happen. You know, I am fully booked. My calendar is overflowing. And that's understandable. Maybe one day you will get to the point where, you know, you relish the idea of sitting down for one hour to two hours at a time. And you're able to kind of carve time out of your day to do that. But right now, we're really focusing on getting started and staying started. So think of it in five-minute blocks. You want to start really, really small. And I'm going to give you some prompts that will help you do that. So, for example, if you're sitting there at the end of the day and you have your five minutes to journal, journaling counts as responding to things like, things I'm most grateful for over the past 24 hours are, and then going off on that and seeing what comes up for you. Uh, lessons I've learned or challenges I've experienced over the last 24 hours, and then seeing what comes up for you around that. Uh, things I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Uh, how I want to feel tomorrow can also be a huge important one, like setting an intention for the next day and how you want to feel. And then my personal favorite is, is there any unfinished business I have right now that I might want to attend to tomorrow? All of those prompts are really, really simple, but they're just ways of having that quick little check-in with yourself, that quick little reconnection, uh, maybe doing a little kind of uh, debrief or evaluation about the day gone by, looking forward to the day ahead, and starting to introduce more consciousness into your life. Five minutes a day is by far the best way to get started. Um, it's really tempting, I think, in the beginning to skip the five minutes a day and then just do like an hour at the end of the week. Uh, but as the title of this class suggests, this is about developing a regular journaling practice. So if you wanna do more than five minutes, that is awesome and I encourage you to do that. But if five minutes is where you're starting at, that definitely, definitely counts. And that is ultimately gonna be the thing that helps you build a regular practice of consistency over quantity in the long term. Big idea number five, create a ritual. So a couple of the points that I'm talking about today, um, I'm talking about them in the context of journaling, but they really apply to any habit you're trying to start. And this is one of those points. Uh, when I say ritual, um, that might bring up very different things for you. You know, some of you might be thinking of elaborate ceremonies and kind of new agey stuff. And what I mean is nothing like that. Um, like a lot of stuff that I'm saying today, really important to keep it simple. A ritual is basically a set of actions that you take before you start journaling and then a specific set of actions that you take after you start journaling. Um, this can be as simple as grabbing a cup of tea, you know, maybe the same tea every time. It can be as simple as putting on, you know, the same kind of music every time. My personal favorite is I like to close the door, uh, close the window, close the curtains, sometimes depending on what kind of mood I'm in, um, and then journal. And then afterwards, kind of reopen the door, reopen the curtains, reopen the window. For me, that's kind of a symbolic act of like shutting outside, shutting out the outside world, so I can have my introspective, reflective time. And then again, the symbolic act of letting the outside world back in and shifting my focus to a more external place when that introspective, reflective time is over. So whatever your ritual um, looks like to you is a completely personal preference. Again, I encourage you to play around, experiment, see what works for you, see what resonates, what really helps. But once you've found something that you think is going to work, stick with it. Because the other reason that rituals are really useful is that they're a way of training our brain. You know, I talked about in the beginning about how journaling can be kind of an unusual experience for us if we're not used to taking this time to really sit with ourselves. 
Um, and what rituals do is that they train our brain to know that when I do these things, then it's time for writing. And it just makes that shift from external focus to introspective reflective focus a lot smoother. Alongside rituals, something else to think about with your ritual that is super important is what time of day are you journaling? And again, I encourage you to get really consistent with this, to carve out your five minutes and then to stick with that. Uh, for most of us, this is either going to be in the morning or in the evening. If you have a more flexible work schedule, it can be any time of day. There's definitely different benefits to doing it at different times of day. But the most important thing is that you can find a time that works to you and stick to it because that will become a really important part of your ritual. So big idea number six, keep it private. There is a lot of discussion in the journaling community around whether you should share your journaling entries. You know, some people like to share them with really trusted friends or therapists. Um, other people like to share them anonymously. Some people don't like to share them at all. Um, obviously, what you want to do is completely up to you and whatever works for you is the right way to do it, as I keep saying. In the beginning, I strongly encourage you to keep your notes private. And there are some really good reasons for this. First of all, when we write, even with the idea that perhaps one day someone might see this, we will unconsciously start writing with an audience in mind. Um, this means that we're far more likely to self-censor, we're far more likely to not be honest with ourselves about maybe some of the things that we need to be honest about. You know, we don't necessarily feel like we have that safe space for, exp for expression and exploration anymore if we think that one day someone might see this. Another reason it's really important is that, as I said, this was one of the biggest barriers that came up for people when I asked on Facebook, you know, what are your biggest barriers or challenges to having a regular journaling practice? Is that people were really afraid that people might read what they'd written. And, you know, I'm guessing underneath that, maybe they were afraid that people would judge them based on what they read. So if you have notebooks, I'd really encourage you to keep them in a safe place. If you are doing digital journaling, it's really easy to password protect your work. Um, some online apps and uh, software now come with encryption as well, so you can keep it super, super safe. But the most important thing is that you do what you need to do to feel like you are preserving that sacred space for yourself. You know, it's for your eyes only, it's not for anyone else. So yeah, it's up to you in whatever way you want to do it to do what you need to do to keep that safe space so that you can use it for expression and exploration. Big idea number seven, start collecting prompts and inspiration. I've already talked about, you know, a, a prompt that you can use when you have a blank brain syndrome and you can't think what to write, which is just to write about that. Um, however, you can make it easy on yourself as well, especially when you're starting out. You can start collecting things that really resonate with you, things like quotes, uh, photos, questions you hear when you think, oh, that was, you know, it's a really good question. I wonder how I would respond to that. Anything that kind of produces a little click moment for you, anything that really impacts you on an emotional level, um, anything that resonates, anything that inspires, anything that provokes memories for you, start collecting these things in whatever way you can and filing them away. Because then what you can do is that if you have experienced blank brain and if, you, if you're kind of tired of responding to that blank brain prompt as well and you're tired of writing about how you don't know what to write about, then you can pull out one of these prompts and sort of go with that. It just makes life a lot easier. Remember, this doesn't have to be a challenge. It doesn't have to be hard. And you can absolutely do um, anything you can to make it easier for yourself. Uh, a prompt that someone actually gave me that I wanted to share with you uh, under the kind of banner of this big idea that I found really helpful was to make a list of the most important questions you're facing at the moment. And if you journal and there's nothing kind of coming up organically for you, to pick one of those questions and write about that. Um, I heard about this recently and I've been doing it since then and it's been pretty huge. It's been really, really rewarding to do that and to, to A, clarify what those questions are for myself and then also, again, to have that space, safe space to unpack them and explore them a little bit more. So let's make a list of the most important questions you're facing at the moment and then just pick one and answer that. Big idea number eight. 
finish with an invitation to action. Journaling is great for processing, but that processing doesn't have to end on the page. This is actually a really, really important big idea to bear in mind, because whenever you're starting something new, the more tangible benefits you can see in your external life as a result of doing that thing, the more likely you are to continue to do it. This is exactly the same with journaling. If you start a regular journaling practice and then you look back over the past few weeks and you can really see the positive impact it's had on your life, that is definitely going to encourage you to continue and it's going to make maintaining that regularity a lot easier. So a really helpful question that I like to ask myself at the end of most of my journaling sessions is, based on what I've written, is there an action I might want to take? So that's, based on what I've written, is there an action I might want to take? The answer is not always going to be yes. It's certainly not for me. And that's absolutely okay. The most important thing here is that you're holding space for the any answers that are in there to come forward. You know, you're holding space to open up and listen to your intuition. Equally, it feels really important to say that if an answer does come up and if you start exploring ways in which you might like to take action, just because you're writing about it doesn't mean you actually have to take action on that thing. There is no obligation to do anything that you don't want to do or don't feel ready to do. I know I've spoken to people in the past and they've said that they've kind of actively shied away from exploring certain topics in their journaling because they're concerned that if they write about it, then they're sort of going to feel pressure to take action on it or they're going to feel like they should or ought to or have to do something about it. So especially while you're starting out, you know, this is your permission slip to say, no, you absolutely don't have to do that. Remember the two E's, expression and exploration. Um, action is not a part of that. It's just exploration. If you want to act, go for it. Like by all means, do so. But especially if you're exploring really big life changes, like you're realizing that maybe you're not that happy in your relationship or your job is kind of sucking the life out of you or one of your really big dreams is to travel the world or um, go to Peru and start a llama farm, you know, whatever it might be. There's all really big life changes. And if you start to take action on all of them at once, you're going to start feeling really overwhelmed. And that overwhelm is not going to help you develop a regular journaling practice. In fact, you're probably going to end up feeling so overwhelmed and maybe a little bit drained, even resentful, that you're not going to want to journal because every time you journal, you're going to feel this huge pressure to take action on what it is you're journaling about. So no obligation, no pressure to act whatsoever, but finish with that invitation to action and just see what comes out of that. So big idea number nine, challenge yourself. This is a big idea I've put close to the end because it's one to shelf for now and pull out uh, a little bit later, maybe in a couple of weeks or months time when you've been journaling regularly, when you're getting really comfortable with that daily five minutes and you are curious about how to take your journaling to the next level. Uh, one way I did this is uh, a few years ago, I want to say back in 2009 or 10, I started using a website called 750 Words, which you can find at 750words.com. So as a little kind of backstory, this is based on a practice which is in the artist way by Julia Cameron, which is a really cool book. If you are a creative or involved in any kind of creative work, the artist's way, highly, highly recommend it. It's a 12 week course and it will totally rock your socks. It is awesome. But one of the kind of staple practices that she talks about from week one in the artist's way is something that she calls morning pages, which are three April pages of stream of consciousness writing. So the guy who created 750 words, Buster Benson, he took this concept and he made it digital. So he worked out that three April pages, it's around about 750 words, and he created a site based on that. So I started using the site, I was really enjoying it, there's a nice kind of social aspect to it. Um, I personally use a pseudonym just because 
as I've been talking about, you know, I want to preserve that safe space for myself. Um, but he has monthly challenges. So when I've been using this site for a while, I decided that I was going to sign up for a monthly challenge and write 750 words every day for a whole month. For me at the time, that was huge. That was like, oh my God, I'm not sure if I can actually do this. <laughs> it felt quite a vulnerable thing to do to sign up for this. It felt like a real mountain to climb. Um, looking back now, um, it's, something I do anyway. It's not any sort of particular effort just because it's come in, into part of my daily routine and it feels very natural. But yeah, at the time, this was quite a big undertaking for me that I did it. And not only did it really help my journaling practice and really deepen my confidence in the fact that I was doing journaling the right way, because that was something I was kind of hung up about when I, when I started journaling regularly, but it also really positively impacted other areas of my life as well. You know, I, I look back at all the words I'd written and I realized that I'd written the equivalent of a short book, which was pretty cool, you know, 30 days. Um, so you never know what's going to happen. I'm not saying that you should go and do the 750words.com challenge. You absolutely can do if that feels right for you. The question I would encourage you to consider is, um, as you're sitting there and feeling more comfortable with your journaling, is to just ask yourself, if I was going to do one thing, or if I were to do one thing to take my journaling to the next level, what would that be? And see what comes up as a result of that really important to be kind okay so this is not a competition it's not a race um, there's no prizes for journaling <laughs> it's just for you so be kind to yourself don't push yourself too far too fast but just think about that question and see what answer comes up so big idea number 10 and potentially the most important big idea apart from big idea number one um, is have fun oh my goodness this is so underrated but um, you know when we're kids we play all the time and that is how we learn we learn through play and as adults there gets to a point where you know we kind of get to a certain age and then people start telling us well you need to start earning money and you have jobs and bills to pay and responsibilities and fun and play just goes out the window and it is such a shame because there are still so many learning opportunities there and you know play is still a really core need that we all have so journaling is a perfect way to engage in some play it can be serious, you know, we can uh, use it. And absolutely, I think it's a good idea to use it for some of the more serious topics that I mentioned earlier, you know, things that maybe we're not quite happy about in life, big changes we want to make. But it's also an amazing opportunity to really let rip and have fun and just have a great time. So uh, you can do this through doodling, you can do scrapbooking, you can do art journaling. I actually recently started diving into art journaling properly. Um, I'm not much of an artist, so I kind of avoided it before, but a uh, really important lesson, it's not about skill. <laughs> That's something that I've been learning. But I recently dived into art journaling, and what really struck me about it is that so much of it relates directly to stuff that we used to do as kids for fun. You know, things like scrapbooking and painting and finger painting and little doodles and stuff like that. Um, so as you're thinking about how to inject more fun into your journaling and how to use journaling as an opportunity for play, and also, you know, really important to point out that the more fun it is, again, the more likely you are to continue. As you're thinking about these things and how am I going to do this for my own journaling practice, I'd encourage you to think about the things that you used to gravitate towards for play when you were a kid. So what things did you really enjoy doing when you were kind of left to your own devices, when you had unscheduled time, when you were left to go and do your own thing? What did you naturally gravitate towards, especially kind of creative stuff? What was that for you? And then think about ways that you can inject that into your journaling now and see what magic happens as a result. So thank you so much for watching today. Uh, I really hope that this has inspired you and encouraged you to start a regular journaling practice. Um, finally, you know, the most important thing that I want to impress on you is that journaling really can be whatever you want it to be. It is a deeply, deeply personal activity. So I really hope that you will maybe watch back through this class now that you've seen it once, cherry pick the bits that work for you, feel free to leave the bits that don't, and create a journaling practice that really resonates with you and feels right to you. Just to come a full circle, uh, at the very end, as I said in big idea number one, the best way to get started is to start. 
And that is my challenge to you right now, is to take those five minutes after you finish watching this video in a sec and grab the nearest piece of paper and pen or open up a new word processing document. Or if you're watching this on your tablet, open up some kind of note taking app, set a timer for five minutes or keep an eye on the clock and just write. You can write about whatever's in your head. You can write about this class. You can write about something that happened earlier. Whatever comes up for you, go with that. So go do that right now. And I hope you'll leave a comment underneath this video and let me know how you get on. Thanks so much for watching. Um, if you want to find out more about journaling, maybe get a few more ideas for prompts, a little bit more information, um, you can check out my website at becomingwhoyouare.net. I also have a book which is available now through Amazon, which is called The Ultimate Guide to Journaling. Um, and that has, I think, over 100 prompts and suggestions that you can use to kind of take your practice to the next level when you're ready. So I hope you'll check that out. Thanks for joining me for this and happy writing.